Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending where you are around the world. Um, and welcome to the first installment of Storytelling for Social and Planetary Change, a four part series that will take place over the month of October. I'm Rebecca Friedman, the director of the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab at Florida International University in Miami. And I'm so excited to be able to be part of the series on storytelling. Storytelling is one of the main areas of research and conversation and teaching for all of us at the Public Humanities Lab. <clears throat> it's storytelling, whether the gathering, narrating, telling, retelling of stories of members of our communities through oral history gathering, poetry writing, street art, just to name a, two, a few genres. To think through and theorize about how we craft and understand the landscape of stories of members of our communities near and far is of the utmost importance in thinking through how we can these days affect change in this crumbling world and continue to fight for social, environmental, and racial justice. I love my work, I feel lucky for it, and I'm so happy to join you here today. So let's go. Without any further ado, let me introduce um, my wonderful colleague, Whitney Bauman. Whitney is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Florida International University here in Miami. He's co-founder and co-director of Counterpoint, Navigating Knowledge, a nonprofit based in Berlin, Germany that holds public discussions over social and ecological issues related to globalization and climate change. And this series is obviously part of that. His areas of research interests fall under the theme of religion, science, and globalization. He's the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship and a Humboldt Fellowship, and his publications include Religion and Ecology, Developing a Planetary Ethic, which just came, which just came out with Columbia University Press in 2019, as well as co-authoring with Kevin O'Brien, Environmental Ethics and Uncertainty, Tack Tackling Wicked Problems, with Rutledge in 2019. He's currently working on a manuscript about the 19th century German romantic scientist Ernst Haeckel, if I, spell, if I pronounce that correctly. So without any further ado, I will give you Whitney. Let me just mention to the audience near and far that um, during the course of the webinar, if you wanna ask any questions, there's a Q&A button at the bottom and we welcome any and all questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate it. Um, and, and we're so grateful to the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab for hosting and supporting this webinar. Um, I feel like it fits in with the, the aims and projects that are, that are already there. So we're happy to be here. So <clears throat> let me just give a, a brief introduction to the overall four week webinar that we're, we're, we're starting today. Why storytelling for social and planetary change? Storytelling is essential to what it means to be human. The process of knowing involves storytelling and our value systems that determine what is just or unjust are all influenced by the stories we tell ourselves. In addition, human beings exist in a planetary context with many other entities, species, rivers, glaciers, oceans, that have a story to tell and that are parts of our own stories. Finally, the power of story and re-narration helps to rethink and create new communities as we've seen with Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and Fridays for Future movements. This is a four-part online wor workshop series that focuses on storytelling and its relationship to knowledge, justice, healing, and the creation of new possible futures for the planetary community. So over the month of October, we'll meet every Wednesday virtually starting at 11 a.m. EDT or EST in the last week, since I think it's uh, daylight savings ends then, to discuss the, or maybe it's the other way around, I always get those confused, but to discuss the various dimensions of this theme with internationally renowned experts from various professions and disciplines. These are free and open to the public, but obviously as nonprofit organizations with a lot of volunteer work, we all gladly accept donations for our work. Um, and you'll find links um, a little later uh, we'll put some links out in the in the chat function uh, that that shows you links to our organizations and where you can choose to support us if you are willing and able. Also, um, just to reiterate, if you have questions, please pose them through the Q and A function of Zoom, um, and you'll find links to the chat uh, the chat and Q and A functions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, the chat function there'll be points of interaction where we might ask a question directly, and you're welcome to put those in chat. You can also chat any of the uh, uh, panelists or just the panelists alone 
uh, with that chat function. Um, but if you have an overall question and answer or Q&A sort of question, um, please put it in the Q&A function because then we'll, we'll return to those towards the end um, and we won't have to look uh, uh, back through the chat history. I'll provide also some information about the coming weeks towards the end of our time together today. But today is our introductory webinar with hosts from two, the two, uh, two of the organizing organizations, the Pachasana Institute and Counterpoint. Counterpoint, navigating knowledge, just to say a little bit about Counterpoint, is a global interdisciplinary research center and information hub founded by Kaku von Stokrad and myself in 2018 and supported by an international advisory board, Counterpoint organizes events and publishes policy papers and reports, as well as a weekly blog and pieces of art and fiction. The ecological, economic, political, and social challenges of the 21st century call for innovative responses and concerted effort. That's why Counterpoint facilitates critical reflection, conversation, and creative solutions to planetary problems. The approach is integrative to use our various areas of knowledge and expertise to work together to solve today's problems. The Pachesana Institute is a collective of Ecuadorian and international scholars, artists, development specialists, and community organizers. They create educational programming that responds to the ever-growing divide between local and global development. They have two areas of emphasis. Um, one is bridging the local and global, and the other is creating alternatives for local communities. With regards to the first, they believe that education is the path toward reimagining new methods of community development. But for this to happen, locals need to learn from the global community and globals need to learn from the local communities. Related to the second, small Ecuadorian communities struggle between economic survival and maintaining their traditional identities. Their work uses strategies to diversify their economies while simultaneously strengthening local knowledge. We came together um, <laughs> earlier this year to start discussing the, this webinar series, and we found a lot of overlap between our organizations. So we hope th that overlap and, and our strength shine through in the, next, in the next four weeks. But today, the speakers are myself, which um, uh, Rebecca already introduced me, so I don't need to do that again, Daniel Bryan, Grace Logan, and Kaku Van Stukrad. I've already uh, been introduced, but let me introduce the other speakers and then I'll turn it over to Daniel and Grace for a bit of storytelling, <laughs> since that's what we're gonna be doing. Daniel Bryan is an educator, activist, and artist. He's the co-founder and director of the Pachesana Institute, a non the nonprofit educational organization that is the co-organizer of this program. Grace Logan was a graduate of the Pachesana's uh, Rehearsing Change Program in 2017 and is now Pachesana's fellow. She has coordinated community-based education programs, participatory action research projects, and led Pachyasana's international outreach department. Kaku van Stukrad is, is the co-founder along with me of Counterpoint. And he's also a professor of religious studies at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. He works on the cultural history of religion, science, and philosophy in Europe. He lives in Berlin. And a revised English version of his recent German book about the topic, um, uh, some of the topics we'll be discussing, will be published as The Soul in the 20th Century, Insights in Psychology, Science, Nature, Philosophy, Spirituality, and Politics from Europe and America. And that'll be out uh, with Columbia Press by the end of 2020. So once again, this series is a workshop, uh, is co-sponsored uh, by the Pachasana Institute, Counterpoint Navigating Knowledge, the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab at Florida International University, the Religious Studies Department at Florida International University, as well as the Department of English at Florida International University. And we are very thankful for all of this uh, co-sponsorship. So having provided you with this maybe not so brief introduction, I now turn it over to Daniel and Grace of the Pachasana Institute. Thank you so much, Whitney. It's really great to be here. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction and, and Rebecca as well. Um, it has been a delight to, to plan this event with, with Counterpoint and have the participation of the Wilsonian. And um, we thought it would be smart just to kind of kick this off with a story. Um, and after the story, we're going to move into a story in which we hope that everyone will, will also participate uh, from, their, from wherever it is they are. Uh, so, for this story, um, hopefully you've, um, some of you may have heard some of this story before, uh, but it's a pygmy myth, um, and so you have to imagine the, uh, a forest in what is now the northern or northeastern part of the uh, DRC, um, uh, 
but uh, some really incredible myths, of course, come from what we now refer to as the global south, but uh, often marginalize the all the knowledge and learning that comes from this. I'm going to start with a little story, and then we'll uh, we'll move on. Uh, the story is about a, a songbird, and you might hear in the background some chirping birds, so as well as a siren. So I think that's also quite appropriate for the times we're living in. I'm going to tell the story with a little bit of forest and mountain behind us. It's a little different than uh, than uh, the forest in the DRC right now, but uh, uh, I think it's more enjoyable to have a, a background that's that's natural and, and pleasant. So. Uh, always when we're listening to stories, you can either watch the storyteller, you can also close your eyes and, and just enjoy and try to go into your own, your own space in your own world. So imagine a young boy walking through the rainforest and he hears what he thinks is the most beautiful song he's ever heard in his life. It comes from a bird. He walks up to the bird and the bird doesn't go away. Rather, the bird just keeps singing and singing and the boy thinks this bird's song needs to be recognized. And he stretches out his hand and the bird jumps onto its finger and he, and he walks with the bird. And they go back home and he shares this bird with its beautiful song as it continues to sing with his father and says, we must share food with the bird. The father looks at his son and says, we're poor. We don't have, we barely have food for ourselves. How can we share food with this bird? But he agrees, shares the food with the bird. The bird continues to sing and then flies away. The next day, the same thing happens. The boy goes out into the forest, finds the bird. The bird is singing. He takes it back home. They share food. The bird sings and flies away. The father more disgruntled than before. The third time it happens. And on the third day, the father has really just had it. Their food is almost out. And so he sends the boy away from the kitchen table, asking them to, asking the boy to go do something, go run an errand. And so the bird is singing, sitting with the father, but instead of offering food, the father grabs the bird and kills it. With the bird dies the song. And with the death of the song, the father died at that moment. We tell this story to realize how dependent we are on stories and the songs that surround us not because they're out there or they're from that, from nature, but because they're inside us. And so that bird story is, is also our story. And so what we're going to do now is uh, go into the next storytelling uh, exercise. Uh, Thank you, Daniel. Um, I love those impromptu bird sound effects. That's a nice touch. Um, great. So for this activity, we, we want us to all to kind of center us in the space as a collective, um, create a story together. Um, so for this, I'm going to ask everyone to find an object in your space that is either something you feel connected to already or that you would like to feel more connected to. Um, this can be a natural element, um, a house plant, a banana, a cup of water, um, or it could be an object that maybe comes from nature but has been transformed through a series of human interventions. So I'm going to give everyone a moment to find their object um, before continuing. Great. I hope everyone's gotten a chance to find their object. Um, so we're going to engage in a short storytelling meditation together. The idea is to explore 
um, and strengthen our connection to nature, to the natural world, through the story of ourselves and this object. Um, so go ahead and close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so um, with your element or object in your hands and we'll begin to guide you. So we ask you to start with your breath because your connection with this object starts with your breathing. With your life, you are connected to whatever this element is. So I want you to come into contact with your body. And then if you can, without opening your eyes, notice what's around you as well. Feel that you are in spaces at the same time. You're sitting in a physical space, but you're also in, in your mind's eye, you know? You're inside. But you're also connected to all of us and all of our spaces. And feel that moment is magical, and then bring it back to this element. Notice this element and feel whether in your hands or in your mind's eye, its texture, its weight, its size. And explore the connection you have with this element. Where does it come from? Maybe it's a natural element, or maybe it's a derivative of, of some other natural element. And after a long series of human interventions, it somehow made it to your hand or into your mind's eye. And now we're going to go to where this element was found or where it came from. Imagine yourself there where this element comes from. What do you see? Are there trees? Maybe there are plants, animals you've never seen before. Maybe there's water nearby. Where is your element in this place? What does the air feel like around you? Is it maybe cold or warm? Dry, humid? Maybe it's still, maybe there's a slight breeze. What do you hear? Maybe there's bird song. Maybe wind rustling. Maybe you hear the sound of a city in the distance, of people, of cars, maybe not. What do you smell? What does the earth smell like where you are? What does the air smell like? Are there people around you? What is the community of this place? And as you look around, you notice that this world is also inhabited by people. You wonder who they are and, and how they interact. And of course, as all people, it's not just magic. There's conflicts, there's strife, there's suffering, there's inequalities, there's inequity. What? pains and trauma do the people in these spaces hold? What do you hear coming from their cries, from their laughters? Take a moment to listen profoundly. And as you do, realize 
that this community is bigger than the community that you see. So now slowly begin to zoom out, slowly, slowly from where you find yourself until you behold this community, this territory, this earth, but more than that, the space time that we all inhabit, these connections that we've explored. What are these connections between you, this object, the natural world, your local global communities, among ourselves here today in this, in this space. What are the conflicts you see? How is it all interconnected? Now I'm going to ask that you slowly return to your body, entering once more earth, your territory, your community, and slowly find yourself back with your body and your breath. And now that you're back here in the place you started, think about how the story impacted you, your relationship with this element, your relationship with your surroundings, your relationship with space and spaces. What we're gonna ask you to do is move into another kind of storytelling called call and response. And when you open your eyes, if you feel comfortable, go into the chat function and simply tell us what your element is. And we'll share that back to you voiced so that you can hear the sound of your element. A terrapin, a lime, autumn air, turquoise, little cypress tree, My element is the candle I light to teach Tai Chi. A reusable bottle with water. A rock. Watercolors. Great, thank you so much. Oh, we also so had much. in the we also had in the question and answer just to make sure that everybody's is heard a meditation pillow purchased in Nepal and a dried flower. Thank you all for sharing. Hopefully, you feel the presence of all these different elements in our shared space now, um, and the different stories that you have dreamed as we went through that meditation are now interconnecting in this space that we're sharing together. And with that, we'll, we'll turn it back over to, to Whitney and Kaku um, as we uh, move on. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, so this is actually um, a related reflection <laughs> and it'll take, um, It'll take uh, uh, also the, the chat function for just a moment. So this is a question that I ask, and if, you, if you've heard me speak before, or if you've um, uh, uh, been in one of, uh, one of the other counterpoint events or something like this, you may have heard me ask this. So don't give away the punchline if you're. <laughs> um, but what my question that I usually start my, my earth ethics class and a lot of my lectures with when I'm talking about, um, talking about humans and nature is what do you, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of nature. And again, just chat in the, 
um, uh, in, the, in the chat function, just chat some answers to us or me, to the whole group, um, however you choose, life-giving. Green, beauty, truth, all my relations, water and wind, God, abundance, air, to be without questions. Um, the, these are all, uh, these are all, of course, excellent answers. Imagine lush green uh, and the ocean. These are all answers uh, that I get fairly often. And sometimes I rarely get um, the, the, uh, someone saying, me, human beings, uh, the city that I'm living in, the computer that I'm <laughs> coming to you uh, through, language, um, human environments, right? And my question then uh, becomes for the whole semester or to set up the lecture, how have we written ourselves outside of the rest of the natural world? And how can we rewrite ourselves back in? And this is, this is uh, part of, of of what I see this, this, this series of um, this webinar around storytelling and retelling doing. So there are a lot of reasons in the Western modern world, whatever that means, um, <laughs> however we construct that, um, that we might think of humans as somehow outside of the rest of the natural world. There's many narratives of transcendence and hierarchy, right? So from the platonic forms, right? In which, um, so the really real is not, here in the material world, but it's it's somewhere in the in the ether, right? And the material participates in it, but the really real is somehow far away, right? Or the Arist the Aristotelian or Ptolemaic universe that has sort of um, uh, not only um, Earth at the center with humans at the center, but also um, uh, eventually a hierarchy of human beings that is always raced, class, gendered, sexed, um, with you know males being somehow. Uh, higher to the, the spiritual world and females being somehow closer to the, the material world, these sorts of things. Um, uh, and along the lines of race, um, <laughs> the sort of white um, upper classes being closer to the, the ether and this sort of thing, and the poorer and darker peoples being closer to the earth, right? So these hierarchies of narratives that, that take an idealized version of humans out of the world, right? And then rank uh, peoples accordingly. This is also a manifestation of this. Uh, the Genesis story, um, it particularly um, the one, not the garden story, but the one with the seven days of creation, which um, in which uh, humans are made and only humans are made in the image of God. Um, and this gives us some sort of, um, some sort of um, space above the rest of the natural world to be able to at best steward the rest of the natural world, at worst subdue, right, the rest of the natural world. Um, so many of these, uh, these types of um, uh, sort of Western modern uh, ideas create this sort of hierarchy that somehow says the place of humans uh, is somehow not of this earth, not of this world. Um, and so these are these all I think are part of the problems um, with 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 why humans have sort of thought themselves outside of the rest of the natural world. Um, and not only that, but many of you said interrelatedness and unity. Uh, Western modern <laughs> understandings of the self have at least dominant interpretations, dominant streams of that understanding have also been sort of isolated individuals, right? <laughs> the sort of Cartesian, I think, therefore I am. Um, uh, so. Um, so this is also part of the problem. I mean, the, the, the economic system of capitalism is based upon this idea of individuals um, and, and, and rational making rational choices um, and, and sort of the idea of private property that can be owned by individual people. So there's, there's all sorts of things that also break our connectivity with the rest of the natural world. Um, and so um, some of this has manifested and, and, and actually, um, uh, <laughs> sort of modern Western science of the reductive and productive models, right, since, since, the, since at least the early 20th century, have also been about um, turning uh, the rest of the natural world into commodities for human use, some more than others. Um, and the, we're, we're now beginning to experience the effects of this idea of thinking ourselves, thinking that we're not part of the rest of the natural world and thinking that we're isolated individuals from gross economic inequities uh, to um, climate change, 
to species extinction, to um, all the racisms that have led up to things like Black Lives Matter movements and all the sexisms that have led up to things like the Me Too movements in this world. So, the, so the, my question uh, then for us um, over the next four weeks is to then th really think about how we can reconnect to the, the fact of our interrelatedness um, with one another historically, politically, economically, culturally, but also with the rest of the natural world, ecologically, biologically, evolutionary, narrowly, and perhaps with the rest of the cosmos even, right? <laughs> Um, the stories that we tell ourselves matter, right? So these, these ideas of human exceptionalism or human transcendence somehow um, um, that are always um, tied up with issues of race, class, speciesism, and, and all sorts of things. Um, these matter the world around us and shape the worlds around us in which we live. And we want to explore in this series both the decolonial and post-colonial stories from around the world, um, from, from places that are... <laughs> that are working to tell their, to, to, to maintain their own stories, but also the stories um, that are being created in a sort of post-colonial and decolonized understanding of, 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 of places, of specific places um, and peoples. But we also want to search for alternative stories from within the history of the spread of what we call Western civilization. Um, uh, and, and it's from there's there's romanticisms and mysticisms and 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 eminent ways of thinking all throughout what we call um, the, the the stories of the West or the history of the West. Um, but all of these, whether um, day colonial, post colonial, or or sort of uh, non dominant traditions within um, within you know Western civilization or whatever, all of these aim at rethinking human human and human Earth relations toward a future. Um, that is more just and that promotes planetary flourishing. And so one of the, one of the ways that I um, sort of try to think about this in, uh, in, in my classes with my students, and it's a little hokey, but you can go along with me, um, and I've done this before, but if you sort of look at this, it might just be a piece of paper, but, and you can put in the chat what, what else you see there um, in terms of this piece of paper. Um, Again, if you know my trick, then you know that's fine. We, <laughs> um, opportunity, tree fibers, very good. Energy, openness and possibility. Potential to write and draw all colors. A seed, beginnings and endings. Very good, ideas, stories, right? So we have all these cultural things, but also ecological things, right? Um, uh, potential people, airplanes, I love that one. Um, but also ecological, playful, and artful things, and trees, right? If you, get to, if you get to a tree, right, you need the soil, and you need water, and you need the sun. And if you get to the sun, then all of a sudden you have the whole cosmos wrapped up from the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago until now in this one piece of paper, right? So. We've done, we've done a great job of, of isolating things and, and maybe perhaps in our re-narrating we can sort of figure out how, you know, through maintaining, connecting through diversity, these, to, to, to re-narrate ourselves um, in these interrelated, um, uh, interrelated webs of existence. And, and that's, uh, that's sort of how I see the, uh, sort of part of the task of this series, but um, I'll let my colleague uh, Kaku um, say a bit more. Well, I, I think you, you, you've uh, phrased it wonderfully, what, what this whole uh, um, experiment, this whole experience is about. And I don't have to add much to that, only what, that some, some of what you, what you described also resonates with the work of the people that we invited to contribute to, to, uh, to these four events or three events, uh, not counting the first one, but the next three ones. So there are so many of these uh, wonderful uh, instructors and teachers that we, that we can learn from who, who share this understanding of kind of uh, not only narrating something and analyzing the narration that, uh, that brought us where we are and the narration or the story that we are not so happy with anymore, um, certainly in many many places around the around the globe, and struggling with 
creating new stories that also will form new realities because we also are the stories that we that we tell and that that is true for individuals for for you know, on a psychological biographical level but it's also true on a cultural level on a community level on a on a global on, on a global level even um, where capitalism like what you said has taken over a, a, a master narrative somehow that also dictates how the world ticks somehow and many of our our <clears throat> um, speakers present alternatives to this and what you said just reminds me for instance of, of uh, David George Haskell who in his book The, the Songs of Trees uh, tries to overcome this this idea that the trees also because you uh, mentioned the, the the piece of paper which is also like an, a, a parody board said a, a former tree <laughs> so so but we are still connected to this tree even even if we write on that paper there was a tree and something else but to to overcome this 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 differentiation to that that we have to find sublime nature outside of the cities and in the cities that is all kind of uh, bad bad things happening there um, while we we also could create new narratives new stories about the trees that are in the city and that's what he's for instance focusing on uh, particularly on the rich rich um, rich life that these trees in the cities tell and the songs that they sing, which is also a metaphor for something that is like uh, what Daniel had in, in the story of the of the bird, which is also both a, a song and a story that is part that that is meshed together somehow. Um, or David Abram has a, a similar similar approach to these things, how we how we are part of the breath of nature and when we tell something, we also breathe stories. And at the same time, we are located in a certain position that, that is both Am I back? <laughs> yes, you're back now, sorry. Yeah, yeah the internet is also, it's... Uh... Yeah, my internet connection is unstable. I get a message here. So, but I'm also almost uh, almost done. And the only thing I, I wanted to add is also that we also are all in a certain position. And that's also what, what Kara Wayne White has so, so masterfully explained how, uh, and, and she's here also today, which is wonderful, that, that uh, we are both part of structures that we don't like 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 racist structures like certain position that certain narratives that put us in a certain position and to free free ourselves out of that uh, that way also out of that position also happens through new stories that we tell or to take series or to read stories that others have told that only haven't nobody has read so so all these things go together so that's just my um more a little bit of a of a footnote to what you said, but a little comment. And I think I give it over to uh, our friends from Pachai Sama. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so that we can um, um, share some images of our work in Ecuador, because right now what we're going to try to do is think about this idea of, of kind of words to practice, theory to practice. And we're going to ground it uh, for just the next few minutes in our work in, in Ecuador. Um, and um, with the hopes that this will also link us into the idea of moving from theory and conversation to practice to embodiment in the work that we're going to be doing over the, these, uh, this next month, every Wednesday. Um, one thing that, that may not be clear for some is that after each panel, uh, there'll be a short break and then there's an interactive workshop with one of the panelists. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And for those who are able to spend some extra time, we really encourage you to stay. Uh, one, because the people who are going to be leading these workshops are, are truly amazing artists and thinkers, uh, therapists. Uh, uh, they come from all walks of life. Um, and very richly, so they're all bilingual in English and Spanish. So if anybody wanted to come and also speak, uh, if Spanish is your first language, you would have the opportunity to do so. 
Um, so as we go through this, we'll also uh, do a little bit of highlighting in how those workshops um, will be focused. Uh, but we wanted just to turn back a little bit to, to Pache Sana and into one of our main programs so that we can ground this talk about storytelling for social and planetary change in practice. Um, Pachai Sana is actually two Kichwa words, and in Ecuador it's Kichwa, not Quechua. Two Kichwa words fused together, that means balanced world. Although world is really not a very good, uh, not a very good uh, definition of Pacha. It's more this idea of space-time or the everything, uh, which is a perfect combination for what we're going to be talking about when, when we think about linking social justice to planetary change. Um, and as uh, Whitney mentioned, we're a small uh, Ecuadorian NGO, and uh, the images we're going to be showing you come from our flagship program called Rehearsing Change. Um, and that's really what, what we want to share today, is how almost everything that we're doing, and I would say everything that we're doing, is really thinking about in gross, or in, in embedding ourselves and embodying stories so that we can think about together between an international population, and when I refer to that, I mean internationals that are coming to Ecuador to live and work in communities, and local communities working together in which they change the story. Because as it says on this slide, if we want to change the world, we must first change our stories. We must uh, first change the stories that we are believing in. Um, and as we're going through such troubling times with pandemic, with um, uh, protests against systemic injustices, with a very, very intense political climate going on around the world, um, led, of course, by campaigning for president in the United States, um, we really need to think about the stories we want to create. So these, uh, we're gonna delve a little bit into the work that we're doing so that you can see what we're trying to do uh, in order to rehearse the change and create new stories. Let's see if I can move this on. And it won't move, but there we go. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so as Daniel said, rehearsing change is, is one of our main educational programs. And it's the example we're going to be using today to kind of ground this idea of story into the various manif manifestations of praxis that it has. Um, so rehearsing change is part of this greater dream to reimagine and create more just alternatives to the dominant models we have of study abroad, of education, um, and of these local global relationships that are embodied in both of these structures. And how we do that a lot of the time is through story. Um, so a good deal of our pedagogy, our methodologies, focus on story as a tool for social change. Um, for transforming and building relationships, um, for exploring conflict, dialoguing, the creation of new possibilities. Um, and we even have one of our core courses of this program is called Storytelling, Language, and Movement. Um, when we think about storytelling in praxis, I think a lot of us might think of this photo in the bottom right hand corner. Um, where there's, you know, folks sitting in a circle, one person, person sharing a story and the rest listening. Um, that is one form of storytelling. But we also invite you to widen your understanding of what story is, how it manifests, um, and how we can participate in it. In our program, we also explore storytelling such as dance, um, illustration, symbol, theater, um, but it also looks like conversation. It looks like how we build relationships in our day-to-day -day lives. And we believe that story happens even when we're not intentionally engaged with it as a tool. Um, our identities are built out of the stories that we tell ourselves, but also the stories that others tell us about ourselves. Um, relationships are built by telling stories. Um, so when we talk about storytelling for social change, for planetary change, we also have to ask ourselves, what is the role of this kind of story? Maybe the story that we're not always intentionally engaged with, but we're always embodying and we're always participating in. So uh, next week, we'll actually have a, our, our topic will be storytelling is knowing. 
Um, and here we'll see a couple of images or a few images uh, of how we've actually done storytelling as knowing in the rehearsing change program. Uh, to the left, you see uh, a, a theatrical piece done by uh, members of a Quechua community named Sawata and international students in which uh, they are on the riverbanks of the Ansu River in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And the knowing isn't so much in the choreography, but actually in this place-based immersion with the river. So to know the river, we must also embody the river. And on the, the right side, knowing is the conflict that we see between the television, the bombardment of information and information and thinking that information is knowing, but then uh, the ancestor comes out from the TV um, to wake us up and help us realize that knowing is different than information. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to participate with Juan Sanchez uh, and for our knowing workshop next week after the panel, uh, Juan will be uh, working with words. So our first day will be Juan is a poet from from Colombia uh, and a teacher at UNC Asheville and will be leading us through some fantastic activities linking words with knowing. Um, and then in terms of so social justice and healing, uh, which will be our next uh, uh, in two, or two weeks from today, uh, we see a couple of images. Once again, this idea of social justice uh, mo very much depicted here on, on the right, uh, where there was uh, last year, almost exactly a, a year ago, uh, there was national protests in Ecuador led by uh, the indigenous peoples against austerity measures. Um, and we were in a community called Pintag, just outside of Quito, and they were very active in that movement. Uh, and here we see a, a, a creation of our response, our way of recognizing this fight um, against uh, for, for, in their words, imperialism. And so you see, we worked with giant puppets um, and you see the abuela, the grandmother, uh, and the one that is connected to the earth versus uh, the, the skeleton, which had different representations of imperialism and oppression and violence. Uh, and to the left, you actually see one of our panelists, that's Bronte Velez. Uh, they will be joining us. Um, on um, the last session for re-narrating and restoring. And in that particular uh, uh, piece, what you see in front of you is the idea of the need to wake up community and we will heal ourselves if we can wake up our community. And so you see actually Bronte uh, dancing her way into uh, uh, this idea of uh, a healed community and a recreated community. Um, I'll mention just briefly that for uh, social justice and healing, we'll have Hector Aristezaba, who's also from Colombia and will be joining us from Colombia, uh, and we'll be working on an embodiment uh, workshop. Uh, so we hope you'll join us for that. That's on the 21st. And then uh, as we move into our, our next slide, talking about re-narrating and restoring, uh, Bronte will be joining us and also uh, working on some embodiment uh, work with us. So when we talk about storytelling for social justice and healing, um, restoring this idea of re-narrating is a key part. Um, I think a lot of us have gotten, or maybe become more familiar with this word reimagining recently. Um, I know in the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a lot of discussion about how can we reimagine public safety to be more just. Um, with the current pandemic, how can we reimagine the way that we relate to each other and the way that we exist in space? Um, and restoring is really another way of looking at this reimagining. Um, but I think it also has this more, it's creation as well. Um, to, so to kind of give us a, an intro to this idea, um, I'm gonna read a quote from one of my favorite authors, Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. If you haven't read it, you really should. Um, <laughs> but it says, the land shows the bruises of an abusive relationship. It is not just the land that is broken, but more importantly, our relationship to land. As Gary Navon has written, we can't meaningfully proceed with healing, with restoration, without restoration. In other words, our relationship with the land cannot heal until we hear its stories. But who will tell them? 
So we believe that for social change, social justice to take place, we have to participate in a process of of restoring these violent dominant narratives, um, such as this narrative of our relationship to land that Whitney's already discussed, that Robin Wachimmer brings up, um, but that we are separate from, that we are dominant over. What would it look like to restory our relationship to be one that prioritizes reciprocity, mutual care, respect, um, to include the stories of those who often aren't included in the dominant narrative? Um, so restoring is really a, a way to reimagine and reinvent our reality um, and empower ourselves by creating our own stories that reflect the world we want to create rather than consuming um, and embodying the stories that others tell us, these dominant narratives. And so as you look at those photos of, of actual classes that are going on in the Rehearsing Change program, we begin to look about we begin to see what it means to restory education as well, which is truly our, our goal in Pachaisana. But I think it's important to be able to do that and to invite you into this process and to, um, to see yourselves differently. We have to really think about our own education story and how it's been influenced by the dominant education story. So I ask you to take just a, a few moments to think about what your education story has been. And as in all stories, think about the characters, think about yourself as the protagonist and all the who's around you, who was involved in that story. What was taught, who decided what was taught? Where was that education story taking place? Look around. And did it reflect the images you just saw on your screen? Did it reflect the force behind me as I told the story? Or what was it? Four walls. And how does that where influence our learning, our learning identities? And then also the how. And that gets into a lot of also what Whitney and Kaku were talking about in this how do we learn? And as we go through the series, I can only uh, ask us all to really think about how stories can become a, a very real part of, of our education and not just a complement to that education. So when we talk about restoring education, we really have to restory these four questions or these four parts of the story. Um, the who, the what, the where, the how. I'm sure as many of us listen to Daniel's questions, our experience has probably reflected one dominant story of education that most of us have experienced. Um, but if we question the who, who do we do education with? Who's included in the process? Who has power in the process? If our goal is to restore it to be more just, um, we have to think of how we can include more folks in the process and not only include, but give them power and agency. Um, what content do we teach? This is really a question of what do we learn um, and whose story does it reflect? What do we consider valuable knowledge? Is written word the only kind of valuable knowledge? Um, or could it also be poetry? Can it be story, theater, art? Um, how do we do education? What does this look like in practice? Um, so I think this kind of goes together with the where, but we're used to these four walls of a classroom, no? Where it's maybe rows of students facing a teacher. Um, and what does that tell us? What's the story of that structure? It tells us that the students are listening. It's a space that encourages stillness, absorption, um, but to give maybe another example of what restoring looks like, in Pachisana, we work in spaces that often are outdoors or that are open. They encourage movement. They, can, they encourage sharing circles, um, which also breaks the structure of who's a teacher and who's a student and kind of blurs these lines so that we're all learning from each other versus this idea of the student learns from the teacher. So for us in all of our work in rehearsing change, 
we're constantly thinking about these four aspects of how we can restore to be more just. But of course, there's plenty of conflicts and complexities in this work, and I'm sure we'll be getting at that over the rest of this discussion and also over the next weeks. Um, we're always asking us ourselves, how do we engage with even embrace conflict when that can be painful? Um, how do we keep ourselves grounded and aware of, of our tendencies to romanticize lived realities through stories? Um, something that, uh, especially with with relationship to Indigenous peoples and Indigenous stories, we, we tend to do and we need to ground those in lived realities through the voices of those we traditionally marginalize. And how do we make ourselves accountable related to privilege, power, and positionality? Uh, something that, that we hope we'll, we'll be able to talk about over, over these weeks with, related, with relationship to, to stories. And of course, how do we make sure that storytelling is balanced with story listening? Uh, there's going to be a lot of talking uh, and uh, throughout this, this uh, series, but also throughout all our, our exchanges. And, and how do we assure that we are profoundly, deeply, and, and radically listening? Uh, we would like to listen a little bit to your story. And so as we continue over the next uh, little while and start a discussion amongst all of us here, uh, we ask you to share in just a few words, if you can, from one to, to 10 words, uh, a part of your story that you'd like to share with those who are also attending this, this webinar. And we will collect those words together. So if you might just wanna share them with the panelists, that would be great. We'll collect those together and at the end, we will, we will read those out um, as one uh, interconnected story. So with that, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing the screen and turn it back over to our friends at, at uh, CounterPoint. Yeah, okay, at this point, um, we, we mostly wanna start hearing also from, from you all um, and you know, just have a, have a conversation, maybe to get things started. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that, that I might ask the other panelists today, but also ask you all to think about is what story, what stories do you tell yourself about what it means to be human in relationship to others in the rest of the natural world. But also um, think about this maybe and in taking into consideration our numerous crises, COVID-19, movements against systemic injustices, climate change and dehumanizing political polarization. So what role can storytelling play in creating a greater understanding and connection to our world? So I think part of the flow of this is sort of like, here's some stories we've been told, here's how we're critical of them, and then what sort of new stories can we tell uh, that really reground us and reattune us to uh, our relationality in the rest of the natural world um, in, in different ways that are hopefully, you know, more just and 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 ecologically sound, um, so to speak. Um, you know, I'll give you my, one of my own examples. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, so, so I grew up uh, in, you know, I grew up in, um, in Arkansas and we had this family farm and we were always there. It was a soybean farm, but it was also this sort of cool place that had hunting and fishing and, and all this stuff. So we grew up with our own family plot. And so I always had this uh, sort of connection with the rest of the natural world, not in some sort of wilderness way, but um, but in, in in a way that like we we sort of depend on the, on the land and so we 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 um, we uh, you know uh, we have to work with the land right that you, the land sometimes will not give you what you want so this understanding that that we're not always in control and this place is like sort of this central idealized place in my mind um, and then you know as I got older I realized you know how connected this farm was with issues of race and class and gender and all these things that today, um, you know, I had to go back and, and think about this, this sort of root of my narrative as this idealized sort of place of my childhood, but also see all of the, <laughs> the isms that were going on there at the same time. Um, and so, you know, that's just, that's just sort of one of the ways in which I've, I've tried to, you know, I can, I'm thinking about storing and restoring and, and sort of what it means to, to go back and, and, and get a thicker description of, 
of the stories that we tell ourselves in terms of our relationships to um, to our past, to other peoples, uh, and to and to the earth. So. I'd love to share on the on the question in that I think with with the times we're living in and, and having so many interactions like this, you know, the Zoom, I, I, I you know, there's so many Zoom jokes out there, I'm sure, especially amongst uh, academics and, and students and, and faculty, because um, that that's where we spend so much time. Uh, but it's interesting that we say that's where we spend so much time. We've given it this idea of, of a, its own space, and it is. There is a Zoom space, right? But um, as I mentioned also at the beginning of the meditation, I think our, our challenge is somehow to be able to, to take advantage of this time and see the opportunities that these boxes present us because they're, they're real and they're not real. There is the opportunity for you to come into my world, for me to come into yours, and for us to, to really practice um, something that I mentioned, this, this idea of radical listening, uh, this, this, this idea of trying to listen not just to the other person that's speaking, but listen to the spaces that we're inhabiting, listen to the space that I'm, that I'm living in, but also the spaces that you're living in. And then this idea of the in-between, I don't know if there's a way, but how do we embrace that in-between? How do we embrace when my hand goes out of the screen? I know it's not gone, I know it's there, but there is some sort of in-between and some sort of magic that, that's available for us. Um, and and I, I guess my, my first thought the, during these times is how can we take advantage of these, what we're calling virtual spaces, as true exploratory spaces. Um, and I know that that's going to be played with in, in the different workshops. Uh, and I'm sure several panelists will be talking about that as, as, as these weeks go on. Um, and I challenge us all to be thinking about how we can restory our own lives within these virtual spaces instead of just waiting it out. I feel like a lot of the political discourse and a lot of our educational discourse is getting through this, just get through it and it'll be fine once it's over but we're not really embracing the stories that we can be telling and listening to right now. Do any of the other panelists wanna to, want to chime in for on this or? Yeah, I, listening to what Daniel just said, I also wonder when we talk about the virtual space, when we talk about concepts like radical listening, um, I also wonder how we can challenge ourselves to, in a way, rethink the stories of these concepts to also make them intersectional. Um, I'm not sure exactly how did it say this, but I think a lot of the times when we hear something like radical listening, um, we kind of view ourselves all on one playing field. But I think there's also a, a bigger story of who's traditionally listened to, who is not traditionally listened to. Does that change in a virtual space or does it not? Um, so I think whenever we talk about these concepts, it's also worth entering into a conversation of how can we take into account these different stories that we all come from when we're constructing a collective story together. To always have that in mind, which I think we, we have to a certain extent in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, movement during this pandemic, um, but to not lose that as we go into the virtual space. I'm just taking a look at some of the, <laughs> um, some of the, the comments here. And I know, that, I know that there's some people that are beginning to, to leave now and such, but I've seen comments about sort of diaspora and also um, um, the concept of unlearning uh, that, that, that needs to happen. And, 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 and we, I think uh, some of us have mentioned that too, but this, this, I, this, um, this, these are two different ideas, but uh, the, the sort of diaspora identities, right? These are hybrid identities um, in such a way that we all live in so many different worlds. And especially, I mean, right here, we, we're all in very different places in different worlds. And how do we, how do we, how do we think about those, um, as you said, uh, uh, and sort of interstitially or, or in a way that's, that doesn't 
necessarily um, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, force everything into one understanding, but but nonetheless connects with each other um, in this sort of way. So how do we do this sort of connecting? And and on the other hand, this uh, concept um, of unlearning, right, um, and the importance of unlearning, um, uh, or or if we want to go with um, with uh, Jack Halberstam's uh, from a, a queer theorist, you know, the the art of failure. You know, we we actually if these if these stories that we've told ourselves are inherently <laughs> You know, bring about climate change, uh, destroying the planet. Uh, you know, racist, sexist, heteronormative, <laughs> ableist, so on and so forth. If these stories are, if if what's succeeding in these stories means it pr it's maintaining all of that, then we need to fail the system, right? And 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 sort of, sort of that that deconstructive or unlearning moment that comes along with dismantling um, uh, before we can even begin to. Um, uh, sort of re restory, if you will. Also this 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 idea of relearning and also telling new stories. I think um, also in some of these comments um, in the chat there, there there's a clear link with crisis situations. So if, if if all goes well, then why change your story? So I'm I'm also interested in in how crisis or the experience of crisis, perception of crisis is actually needed maybe uh, of failure in Halberstam, a kind of failure is actually needed to be in a position to say, okay, now I have um, enough motivation to look for a bet better story or for a different story, which will carry me through the next phase um, without kind of uh, yeah failing or failing differently or whatever. So, but, but it's, also interesting, uh, I think, to look at the the link between uh, something that is perceived as as a crisis on personal, biographic, but also community and also uh, planetary level, and how this reflects in the need and the search for new stories. So we had a question about, um, I did not understand completely what kind of story you're looking for, some part of my story or a story of certain project place or space. I, I took it as a part of my own story, but maybe uh, Grace or Daniel, you meant all of these things. I'm not sure. Yeah, feel free to share just a few words of your own story um, that you feel comfortable in sharing. Uh, they'll be shared then anonymously uh, as we kind of weave together some, some pieces of the different comments that, that people are sharing uh, so that we do have a collective story. And I think that goes into one of the, the comments that was made um, by a, a participant right now uh, who is talking about being very interested in these stories of unity. Um, and um, while I, I fully agree with that, sometimes the words, I get lost in the words because of the politicization of, we need to unite the country, we need to unite this, or we need to unite that, which is of course true, um, uh, but I feel they've been co-opted by our, by our, our politicians. Um, and I can't help but, but believe we need to interweave our stories and understand our stories as pluriversal and not universal. There is, there's a tremendous, um, uh, for me, there's, there's this idea of still, you know, universal knowledge. So many people that are attending this and are speaking right now have university affiliations. Um, and I believe the stories that we are telling will show that this is all outdated and time to change. And eventually we'll be creating pluriversities. Eventually we will be celebrating each and every story, not as how it serves the big story, but how it is its own story. And through the interweaving, we've created then a pluriversal whole. Um, in which thinking like a quilt, each story is its own block and it's woven together, but it speaks for itself, it is itself. Um, so I know that that, uh, that was an extended answer to the question, but basically, yes, please, we'd like to weave your story into to the others. And I would just add sort of that pluriverse, that pluriversality or multiplicity or 
multitude or whatever we might want to call it, this relates back to what I was saying earlier about this, 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 this hierarchy, right? And writing humans outside of the earth also is tied up with a, a monological understanding of knowledge in which knowledge is, is from no place, right? If you want to follow sort of the decolonial literature and, and, and these sorts of things with this idea of, um, of, of objective knowledge that feminists and so many people have critiqued over the last, over the last century, right? Um, all these post thinkers, right? Is, the, is that, you know, once you, once you take, you know, yourself, this whole idea of, I think therefore I am should be like, no, I'm in a place and through that place, I think, you know, so that knowledge becomes this eminent process. Um, and it opens up to multiple, multiple ways of knowing multiple stories and this sort of thing. Great. We have a lot of, of great um, ideas and stories <laughs> and pieces of things now in our, in our group chat. Um, let me, do you want, should I, should I maybe while, um, while um, one, somebody's putting these together, I can go ahead and talk a little bit about the next, uh, the next three weeks. Okay, I'll do that. So um, obviously today's a, a little bit different because we don't, um, oh, this is the introduction. So uh, normally um, uh, starting next week, um, the, there will be a, a panels that go from about 11 until 1230. And then um, there'll be a short break. And then from 12.45 PM to 2 PM, there'll be a, um, there will be a, uh, uh, an interactive workshop. And so for next week, um, October 14th, uh, uh, starting at 11 AM uh, Eastern Standard Time, um, we'll have with us David Abram, uh, Juan Sanchez, and Polly Walker um, um, talking about storytelling as ways of knowing. Um, and you can find more information about this on, on either of our organization's websites. You can find the bios and this sort of thing. And um, maybe one of my colleagues can put those uh, links in the chat again. Um, and then on October 21st, we're going to talk about stories of justice and healing. Uh, again, starting at 11 a.m. Oh, and sorry, excuse me. The interactive workshop on the 14th will be led by Juan Sanchez. Um, I'm just reminding you of this uh, because Daniel and Grace have already mentioned this earlier. So then on October 21st, uh, starting at 11 a.m., the panel on justice and healing will be with Carol Wayne White, Taya Brooks, Preback, and Hector Aristizabal. Aristizabal. Did I say it anywhere right? Aristizabal. <laughs> Aristizabal, thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, Hector Aristizabal will also be leading the, facilitating the interactive, interactive workshop. And then finally, on October 28th, we're going to close out with a panel on re-narrating. Um, and we'll have with us um, David George Haskell, Bronte Velez, and Alexandra Cornelius. Um, and then the interactive workshop that day will be um, guest facilitated by Bronte Velez. And so again, you can find information about um, all of these folks and a longer, a little bit longer um, description of the the various days on the website. And there you can also find the registration if you haven't already registered for um, all of the events. Um, and then finally, before I turn it over to a little um, uh, uh, point at which we, we sort of try to bring some of the reflections together that we've, we've taken from you, um, I'll just uh, once again remind you that um, these are free and open to the public. Tell your friends how wonderful this was. Um, if you didn't think it was wonderful, lie to them so that they will register. And also, um, they are free and open to the public, but if you are able and willing and want to, please think about um, uh, a small donation to, to one of our organizations. That would be much appreciated. Um, so, um, I don't know if, if you all are ready. <laughs> You're ready, Grace and Daniel? Okay, I'm gonna let you all take it from here then. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen because um, I made a poem story um, out of everyone's stories. Okay, let's see, share screen. Oh shoot, I don't think I can share screen. Let's see.
Okay, so it's not gonna let me share my screen until I quit Zoom. That's my bad, everyone. Um, but I will read it. Um, so maybe close your eyes so we can. Um, uh, Grace, um, yeah. Javier, uh, our, the, our, uh, our tech guru with us has to try again. Okay, let me try. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Javier. Okay. Great. So I've taken phrases, words from everyone's stories and created a collective poem. I am my father's daughter. My story starts in Venice. My story starts in Ghana, the Appalachian Mountains, Washington DC, the Amazon rainforest, the Andes Mountains, places and spaces. I am the children of Indian and immigrant and African immigrants, parental tragedies. I grew up with the story of the sea. They taught me to see magic in every leaf and shell. Learning to be the best being I can be during my time on this earth. My relationship to the natural world is to avoid dense places, danger. I am more comfortable in planned open spaces unlearning. Unlearn the boxes we have built around our ways of thinking, learning, reshape the narrative, question the rules and norms, live my life more intentionally, growing these complex relationships, drive to connect myself with myself, others, the planet. I understand both less and more about the world around me. One of my favorite sounds in the world is the singing of fishing lines in the wind. Thank you all for sharing. Um, it's really powerful to, to see us all brought together over this virtual space through our collective story. Um, so thank you so much for being here today and your willingness to participate and share with us. Yes, thank you so much. And um, thank you again to our hosts um, uh, at the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. Thank you, Rebecca, for being here to introduce us. And thank you very much, um, Javier Rodriguez, for being our tech guru today. Um, and uh, please come back and, uh, and join us uh, in the next coming weeks. And thanks again to all of our co-sponsors. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. See you next week. Thank you everybody from Ecuador. Thank you so much. We know we have people from all around the world. So it's, it's great also to think about that. And, and uh, we'll be seeing you next week. <laughs>